Several of the big questions in philosophy of religion concern the afterlife. Questions like, is there an afterlife? What's it like? Can we access it from this existence? And if we can, could, is it possible for us to get some answers about the character of it and the nature of it? The view that there's an immortal soul that survives the death of the body is very popular. 80 plus percent of Americans believe in it, and their views split up among uh, views like an immaterial afterlife, a spiritual afterlife, a resurrection in the afterlife of your physical body, a transcendent new form of consciousness in the afterlife, reincarnation, and so on. So let's see if we can figure out what sorts of experiences in this life we could have that might give us some more clarity about the next. So near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences are by far the most common form of experience that is cited as evidence for some other kind of existence. Millions of people have reported something like them and they often have very similar descriptions of floating uh, out of your body up a tunnel towards a light. It's warm and comfortable and reassuring and there's some sort of presence at the other end. And we've got to wonder, well, how might this evidence work for some other world? That is, so here's our, using evidence very loosely here, very broadly, here's some testimony about an out-of-body experience, a near-death experience, prayer feelings, religious experience feelings, intuitions of certainty or poignancy. Sometimes people talk about self-authenticating experience or some other extraordinary subjective phenomena. And if that stuff is given us, the, the, the idea is that that stuff may possibly give us some access to this other world or this other kind of existence. Now this would be interesting for a number of reasons. For one, this is a really strange sort of experience. It's a non-empirical experience. It's not of ordinary spatial temporal objects, but it's experiential. So it's a new kind, a new way of acquiring knowledge. And these methods are different than the rest of our sort of experience of the world because they're subjective. It's not uh, the objects here or the things we access are not intersubjectively verifiable the way an elephant might be. An elephant, you and me can both look at it, we can measure it, we can weigh it. It's a public object that we can both get access to. We can go away, we can come back, and the elephant's still there. So it's intersubjectively verifiable, it's spatial, it's temporal, and it's got these properties that give us access to it. But religious experiences or out-of-body experiences are peculiar in being a kind of experience, but it's subjective. Nobody else can get to it, it's just something you're having um, within your own subjective awareness. Um, and they might be some sort of divination of the truth or some kind of special access to the truth that doesn't have the same sorts of pitfalls or problems that you'd have with ordinary empirical experience. Okay, so what we're talking about then is something like magical knowledge of, or magical forces. Your mind might be able to reach to this other place and draw from it, or you're having an experience of it when you have an out-of-body experience. Or uh, maybe your mind can channel the magic or the power back into this world. Uh, Star Wars is fiction, of course, but it's very common for people to believe that they can influence events at a distance with the powers of their minds. Perhaps if some of these claims are real, then what's happening there is connected to what might be happening with out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, and religious experiences. Okay, so a big question we've got to ask is, are... OBEs, NDEs, and religious experiences too extraordinary to be natural. Why not? Um, if we've got these two different competing hypotheses, it's a, na a purely natural event or it's a, an event that's suggesting something supernatural, why not just think they're natural? Well, some back relevant background information here is that some natural brain disorders or dysfunctions are un amazingly uh, exotic and uh, give us some perspective on just what your brain can do on its own when it's got problems. You're familiar with, no doubt, deja vu, jamais vu, disassociated states, auditory, and visual hallucinations. Those are all quite common. There's some other more exotic uh, brain disorders. Uh, Capgrass delusion is a case where a loved one has been replaced by an imposter. Frigoli delusion is uh, an inverted kind of delusion from Capgrass. Different, you, this, this patient thinks that lots of different people are actually one person who's 
dressed up in clever disguises. Prosopagnosia is the inability to recognize faces. These patients do just fine with other kinds of objects, but not with faces. Catard's delusion patients are convinced that they're dead or that they don't exist. Blind sight patients feel blind, but in fact they're not. We can test them and they can perform well on visual tests, but it feels blind to them from their perspective. Phantom limb pain is not uncommon for somebody to have an amputated limb and it still hurts on that finger or it still itches on that foot. Balint syndrome are people who can only see one object at a time and this is a kind of subjective awareness you can hardly imagine being in where out of all the objects in their field of vision they can only see one and they can't tell you about the other stuff that's going on there. Anton Babinski syndrome is the opposite of blindsight. This is someone who actually is blind, demonstrably blind, but they're utterly, utterly, utterly convinced that they're not blind. And when you ask her or him, why is it you can't do well on these tests, they will make up or confabulate excuses for why they're doing poorly on the test. Okay, so what's the point of all of those disorders? Well, in those cases, uh, those disorders are springing from the brain. Now we know that all experience, whether it's a, a, of an authentic or real event or, or a false event, has a neural correlate. So there are neural events with capgrass delusion and there's neural events when you actually see somebody who's dressed up in a costume. So what's important about the capgrass case or the delusional cases is that in those cases it's all brain phenomena and nothing else. There's a neural event, but the alleged external fact is illusory. It's false. So your spouse isn't an imposter with capgrass delusion. Your arm isn't in pain with phantom limb pain. You can't see when you have Anton Bambinsky delusion. You do exist, contrary to Cotard's delusion, and so on. Now, are there natural ways to get to the other side? And this is a question that's relevant to sort of the question of whether, what's the best explanation for NDEs and OBEs and the like, whether we should adopt a natural or a supernatural explanation. Well, we also know that there's these artificial ways to get there. You can take psychoactive drugs like uh, psilocybin mushrooms. You can just do sleep deprivation for a couple of days and start to have weird altered states of consciousness. Fasting, sweat lodges, dancing, dehydration, meditation, chanting, sensory overload and stimulus. Maybe a really awesome philosophy lecture or an orgasm will take you to some kind of altered state of consciousness or just a good old-fashioned Justin Bieber concert which uh, gives everybody a thrill, right? Okay, so what do all of these false experiences uh, suggest to us? Well, they suggest this. If we can have those feelings falsely, then we need some form of error checking. We know that the error rates are very high for these altered weird uh, experience reports that very often people uh, are getting there through some deceptive or fraudulent or mistaken means. And enough so that I think that we can assume that anytime we get one of those reports, we should assume at the outset that there's a natural explanation unless a substantial burden of proof has been met otherwise. So that's not to say that they can't be from a supernatural source, but I think our preliminary assumption should be when we get one of those stories that it's probably natural, not probably supernatural. Okay, so since we've got that burden of proof, what could establish that some altered state of consciousness was authentic, that is, an actual experience of another reality, versus a mistake? Well, we'd need compelling evidence that it was not springing from the brain or natural causes alone not just coming from the brain and we need some kind of error checking. And there's another kind of distinction that we need that's relevant here. The very first question we should ask concerns another way for one of these reports to be false. Someone might claim to have had an experience of another reality without experiencing anything unusual even subjectively.
That is, somebody could lie or be mistaken when she says, I had an, had an out-of-body experience. So it would turn out to be false that she even had the mere experience subjectively. But somebody could have an extraordinary experience subjectively, like you would if you took MDMA or hallucinogenic mushrooms. So it would be true that you had a subjective experience of the wild walls bending or synesthesia or of dragons flying about the room, but it was false that the walls were actually bent and that there was actually a dragon in the room. Given how many times people have been mistaken, deceived, or fraudulent about these sorts of claims at both levels, it would be useful in these cases to ask the first question first. Did he actually have a weird experience? And then if we're satisfied that he did, then we could ask, okay, was it an authentic experience or is it based on a mistake? Now, if somebody had an out-of-body experience or a religious experience while they're dead. Now that would be interesting because that would suggest that maybe there's no uh, brain that's producing this uh, experience. If he's dead then the out-of-body experience can't be falsely coming from the brain because the brain's not operating, right? Well it turns out that's not so easy. Turns out there's different kinds of death here. The softest or first preliminary kind of death we need to think about is cardiopulmonary death. And doctors will declare this when there's no heartbeat or respiration that's detectable. Now, this is, introduces a relevant distinction because there's a difference between no detectable heart rate and no heartbeat. So you might have some brand new uh, trainee on the ambulance ride who's just learning how to do some of this and he's not so good at finding the pulse yet and he might declare that somebody's got no pulse simply because he's incompetent or he can't find it but in fact somebody does have a pulse so that would be a case where somebody's been declared might get declared cardiopulmonary dead and not actually be dead even CP dead so uh, that will be a relevant question to ask in these kinds of examples. Surely if somebody is dead though and they are concurrently having experiences of floating through a tunnel towards a light or seeing long dead loved ones or feeling God then that cannot be her brain that's fabricating all of it right. If you're having an out-of-body experience while you're CP dead, really CP dead, that would be evidence of the other side, right? Seems suggestive. Well it turns out no. Turns out death is much fuzzier than you might have been led to think. Being cardiopulmonary dead isn't very dead. It happens frequently and it's routinely reversed. And during CP death, neurometabolic activity can continue, especially if there's CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, going on to sustain the neural activity. And the trauma of cardiopulmonary death itself often causes the abnormal brain function that leads to out-of-body experiences. Uh, oxygen deprivation to the brain, for instance, will produce feelings of floating and of a tunnel, uh, tunnel vision and warmth and will produce the kinds of dreamlike states that people often report there. Now, we do know that after three minutes or so of oxygen deprivation to the cells in the brain, you will get start to get irreversible cell damage. So that leaves quite a bit of time between cardiopulmonary death and cell death or something more substantial for some metabolic activity to happen and for some uh, experiences to be, be produced falsely by the brain by itself. And there's been cases where we've cultured neurons hours after clinical death. That is to say, there were nerve cells that were still alive long after a person was uh, declared dead. Uh, there's an example of a cat that was revived after circulatory arrest after a full hour. Uh, no telling what kind of shape the cat was in after that, though. So I think provisionally we ought to exp we got to conclude that the best explanation for a out of body experience or a or, or a religious experience that is uh, claimed to have happened during cardiopulmonary death is that's probably the false product of residual brain activity. Now, could somebody be deader? Surely they can. There's something more dead here. There's brain death. Brain death is irreversible, real death, and brain death gets declared when there's no reflex responses, there's no breathing, there's no brainstem activity. Now, again, like we saw with cardiopulmonary death, 
we can fail to detect reflexes or not detect breathing and not detect brainstem activity, but some or all of those might still be functioning. And that's to say that brain death, uh, detected brain death, is not equivalent to brain death. And there's been a number of known cases where people have mistakenly identified a patient as or a victim as brain dead when in fact the patient wasn't. And there have been a few extraordinary cases where someone was re revived from brain death, although these were probably cases where the brain death pronouncement was a mistake. But otherwise, we don't have any reliable cases of somebody coming back from brain death. Now, what can we do about measuring brain death and real death? What's next here? Well, it turns out that we have pretty crude methods for measuring brain death. We're checking for reflexes. They're looking to see whether the eyes dilate. Um, very often they'll use an EEG machine that gives a gross indicator of, of large-scale electrical activity in the brain um, and reflexes are macro behaviors. The problem is that there are billions of neurons with activity at the molecular level. And if all the diagnostic criteria for brain death have been met, can we safely conclude that all neural activity has ceased? Because we're wondering whether or not neural activity might be producing the experience. Well, that's an open question, and that's a really interesting question. And the point at which that happens is yet deader still. How dead can somebody be? Well, there's 200 billion neurons in the human brain. And there's metabolism that happens in each that's supplied by oxygenated blood. There are ions producing electrical chemical charges on the surface or on the cell wall of the neurons. And the cell fires hundreds of times a second, typically, and a signal's passed on to thousands of other neurons, depending on how many others it's connected to. And then cascading electrical charges across various neural networks produce consciousness, including hallucin hallucinations in consciousness. So even if the EEG is flat, some of this activity is going to persist for a while. The EEG is a bit like measuring, um, imagine you were trying to measure a P by using a, um, uh, a measuring tape that only has quarter miles uh, marked off on it. So it's a very long measuring tape and P's don't show up. Uh, P, uh, the P dimension is not even, it's smaller than the smallest measures on the ruler. So we need a new category of being dead to identify or talk about or get to the particular kind of phenomena we're interested in to rule out OBEs and religious experiences being products of neural activity. I propose we call it McCormick dead. And this will be the point at which all metabolic activity in an organ organism ceases, or at least in their brain. And I figure if I can ever be immortal, maybe it'll be immortal by if it'll be immortal if this. I can get, achieve some immortality by uh, uh, achieving some fame for this category. So the idea is. Um, if somebody has an OBE or a religious experience during brain death, is that enough to uh, give us uh, some suggestion of this transcendent experience or this other world? If somebody had one of these during real brain death or during a period when the portions of the brain that could produce it were not active, then that would be suggestive, right? Now, if somebody had an OBE during McCormick death, we'd have home run evidence for an afterlife because now you've got experience happening without a brain functioning at all. We would have a brainless mind, a soul independent from a body experience without neurology. The problem is that there have been no reliable reported cases that I can find of any OBE happening during actual brain death. and. Even worse, nobody tells any stories after they get McCormick dead. Nobody comes back from that. There's too, they're too far gone. There's too much damage. Now, one problem is that the cases we hear about are typically uh, anecdotal. You hear a friend talk about somebody he knows who claims that this happened to him, or your aunt told a story about something she experienced when she was in the hospital. And the thing is that people are notoriously unreliable sources of information about extraordinary events of this sort. So mere anecdotes need to be treated with some suspicion. So what do we think now? Are out-of-body experiences or religious experiences evidence?
Well, we know that brain functions can produce those sorts of experiences falsely. Trauma, hypoxia, and drugs induce altered states of consciousness where there's nothing really going on out outside. Neural activity that can produce OBEs or religious experiences can persist long after CP death or even during brain death. So we have a strong presumption that the OBEs and REs are the false products of residual brain function until we've really met a big burden of proof otherwise. Uh, an anecdote of an out-of-body experience during death is not evidence. It's not reliable enough. An out-of-body experience during what appears to be cardiopulmonary death, that's not evidence either for the metabolic activity problem we saw earlier. An out-of-body experience during actual cardiopulmonary death uh, is not evidence. We don't have any evidence of that sort. We don't. We can't establish any kinds of cases like that that seem to be reliable, or at least none that I can find. An out-of-body experience during um, detected brain death is not evidence because we can't find those cases. And an out-of-body experience during actual brain death that would be interesting, but it's probably not evidence because of the detection rate detection error problem. And if you have an out-of-body experience during McCormick death, yeah, that would be evidence, but it doesn't happen. Or we don't seem to be, have found any cases like that. We don't have any of those sorts of cases because dead men tell, tell no tales. Okay, so doesn't look good for the kinds of examples of cases we've actually got. So, But hypothetically, what might prove um, a that a mind could exist out there or a soul could be out there separate from the brain and you could have this experience of this other reality without it coming falsely from your brain. What What's the proof of concept for out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, or religious experiences evidence of another world? Well, I want to raise a problem that I think will defeat these cases even if we get some more compelling evidence in their favor. Here's a question. Could it be established that someone who had an out-of-body experience during a period of drain death, could we prove that they had that experience during that segment of their experience? So look at the EEG measure here. If the, if, if the brain goes flat during this period and they report about the experience, can we establish that the experience happened during that flatline period? And I'm going to argue that it doesn't look like we can. And here's why. I'm going to call this the timing problem. So suppose somebody's got brain activity up till 10.01, and then they've got flat brain activity. This doesn't happen, but suppose it could. And suppose they have flat brain activity, no neural activity for four minutes. And then later we manage to revive or resuscitate this person. And then suppose at 1045, she finally becomes conscious and she tells us what she experienced at 1045. So 40 minutes later. It's the first thing we've got to ask them, right? What's the other side like? Okay, so suppose somebody came back from real brain death and reported an out-of-body experience. How would we establish that the experience the patient reports happened during the period of flat brain activity? Can we just take their word for it? How does she know that it happened at 10.02? Suppose she says, I was floating up through space to heaven and they had a clock in heaven that said 10.04 and I also checked my angel watch. Okay, so we got a time index problem here. You can see what I'm getting at is that if she tells us at 1045 that she had this experience, how are we determining when it happened? We don't know. Perhaps it happened at 1020. Perhaps it happened at 945. She's not that good at telling time. You're not that good at telling time. You're sitting through a long, boring lecture, and it seems like it drags on for hours, when in fact it's only been 24 minutes. So how do we get some kind of objective indicator or measure that it happened during that period? And I don't see any way to get around this calibration problem or this um, synchronization problem.
And the other confounding problem here is that testimony from a brain dead or formerly brain dead patient isn't very reliable. People are notoriously unreliable in their testimony about events during periods of stress. They get the order of events wrong, they leave out significant details, they revise their stories, they're highly suggestible, they improve their stories over time, as you know when you listen to your uncle talk about the fish he caught. They fabricate details and they have a very poor subjective sense of time. And to make matters war worse, this hypothetical patient we've been talking about has just suffered severe brain trauma, is, and she's full of psychoactive medications, she's had severe blood loss maybe, and had other mind alterations from all of the stuff that's happened to her in the hospital or in the emergency room. So we don't have much here to lend credibility to her story, even if she says that this whole thing happened to her at 10.04, um, or if she says she saw a screaming, freaking out SpongeBob SquarePants. Okay, so I conclude then that uh, even if we had a, an out-of-body experience reported by somebody who had brain, been, brain, been brain dead, that would be inconclusive. A person's testimony that the experience occurred during the flatline period wouldn't be sufficient to show that he was dead then. That's the timing problem. So it appears to be very difficult to get the evidence we would need to prove it. There's still a very high likelihood that the experience, if they had one, was generated falsely by residual brain activity. And we, of course, we know that angels don't have watches. Or, even if they do have watches, how do we know their watches are synced up with our watches? Okay, so in conclusion, the notion that our feelings are some magical guide to some secret knowledge is common and seductive. There's lots of people that get pulled into this idea that they can have this subjective access to this other world. But those feelings can be produced by abnormal or even normal brain states. They're very easy to generate them. Being clinically dead, it turns out, isn't being really dead. Your brain could make an OBE then, especially if it's cardiopulmonary death. No one comes back to tell stories from real, profound, pervasive brain death. From McCormick death, nobody can tell, uh, tell us about what they experienced from there. But even if you could, the timing problem would keep us from believing you, because we don't know when it happened. The prospects for successfully arguing for the existence or reality of some transcendent, non-physical, non-brainy reality on the basis of our feelings are dim. It looks like it's a, we've got very poor chances of proving this uh, external reality when they're subjective this way and the rest of us can't get to them. Amen.